Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this week's study as we continue in our conversation going through these documents. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father to enlighten our minds, show us that which we need to understand so that we may more properly understand his word of truth and be able to give a reason for the faith for which we hold. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you. We know that we have sinned and we fall short of your glory. We now ask, Father, for your blessing and your guidance and your forgiveness. We need your forgiveness because of that which we have done. We need your guidance so that we may more properly understand what you are trying to say to us. We need your blessing as we open your word so that we may more properly understand the time in which we are living. Direct us now. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do. Help us. May your angels attend us. May your spirit enlighten our minds so that we may fully understand that which you would want to tell us at this time. For this we pray. For this we thank you. And for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, yesterday we were leaving off in this area regarding what Pruitt had written in 2009. As he was stating in this in this one paragraph, the seven-year prophetic period of Jewish captivity Miller found in several Bible passages. He found it in Leviticus 26. He also found it in Deuteronomy 15 figured under the seven-year release, the sabbatical year. He found it also, albeit in typological fashion, in the story of Nebuchadnezzar's grass-eating period, and he found it also in an obscure interpretation of Ezekiel 39.9. Now, we didn't touch much on Ezekiel 39.9, and that verse reads, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Now, his one footnote here in the book states, a chief problem with the incidents in Ezekiel is that it finds the fulfillment of a prophecy of a future war and post-war cleanup beginning so early that the war is ended and the cleanup is ongoing for decades before Ezekiel ever makes the prophetic prediction. Presumably, this is why the 2300 days never show up in Revelation, while the 1260-day prophecy does. If one thinks this through, he will also see that it is an argument against Miller's understanding of Revelation 11:2 as well. Any thoughts? Any comments? I have no, I have no idea what he's talking about. So why does he say that this has occurred decades before Ezekiel ever makes the prophetic prediction? Right. So is he talking about the destruction of northern Israel? Like it, it doesn't make sense to me how he's how. He's interpreting the text that is uh, Pruitt. Well, Pruitt is making this out to seem that Miller is making these statements. I don't recall anything. Yeah, well, this, well, well, this is the prophecy against Gog, right? Correct. Uh, 39.1, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now, we understand Nishik and Tubal uh, to refer to cities in Russia, okay. Moscow, and Tubalski. So, I mean, that's that's the way A.T. Jones takes it, uh, uh, because these are these are references dealing with the, the scattering of the nations. Okay. And uh, so we can sort of label them as as Russia. Now, as far as Gog itself, that's bit obscure, but we know Gog and Magog, that's the Battle of Armageddon, right? Okay. They're going to be gathered together. And then here later, it's going to say, uh, 
uh, in verse 6, I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel, but I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day where I have spoken. They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, and the bows and the arrows, and the hand stays and the spears. They shall burn them with fire seven years. So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forests. They shall burn the weapons with fire. And they shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. Um, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel and the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. They shall call it the valley, valley of Ha Mongog, Ha Haman Gog. And then it says, And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Now, I mean, what I would say, and there's going to be, you know, and it says, um, I should read the rest of this. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. It shall be to them a renown, a renown. It shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified saith the Lord God, and they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search, and the passengers that pass through the land, when they when any seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it, so the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And also the name of the city shall be Amona, thus shall they cleanse the land. I mean, so one is it's it's rather an obscure prophecy that most of us have never dealt with. But what he's saying here, the war has ended and the cleanup is ongoing for decades before Ezekiel ever makes the prophetic prediction, which makes no sense. So he's he's putting this as something in the past. Right. Right. Agreed. So he's saying that Ezekiel is prophesying about something in the past. Is is that what he's saying, or is he saying cause that's what it seems like he's saying? I think he's showing his disagreement with Miller. Yes, but he's saying that Ezekiel. The reason why he doesn't agree with this application is because Ezekiel's talking about the past, not the future. So he says there's a problem with the incidents in Ezekiel in that it finds the fulfillment of a prophecy of a future war and post-war cleanup beginning so early that the war is ended and the cleanup is ongoing for decades before Ezekiel ever makes the prophetic prediction. So he's saying that Ezekiel's not even making a prediction, he's talking about the past. Right? Right. Which, even if that were true, how would that matter? I don't think it is true because I think it's it's uh, apocalyptic in nature. So it's referring to the end, you know, to, to the end of the world. And then I, I don't even understand his argument here. Presumably, this is why the 2300 days never show up in Revelation. And so, I mean, maybe I don't really understand at all what uh, Miller says about this verse. But. I mean, this footnote's pretty cryptic. It's he doesn't really explain anything. Like, if it is fulfilled earlier, when is it fulfilled? He's not telling us. Right. He's not. He's not really explaining any of this. I mean, he says if one thinks this through, you will also see that it is arguments against Miller's understanding of Revelation 11, verse two, as well. And I'm not sure. I mean, I can't think it through because I have not enough information. Okay. So, um, so I mean, what we would have to do is look at you know, what Miller says about it, I guess. All right. I'll see what I can do to find something from Miller's writings regarding this passage. 
Yeah, well, I have it here. Okay. So he says, here's one anyway. He says, to understand the literal meaning of figures used in prophecy, I've pursued the following method. I find the word beast used in a figure of sense. I take my concordance, trace the word, and in Daniel 7.17, it is explained to mean kings or kingdoms. Again, I come across the word words bird or fowl, and in Isaiah 46.2, it is used meaning a conqueror or warrior, uh, Cyrus. Also in Ezekiel 39, verse 4 to 9, right? so he's just referring here to the verse 9 in his footnote. So Ezekiel 39, verse 4 to 9, denotes armies or conquerors. Again, the word air or wind is used. So but he's just saying so that, that a foul uh, refers to armies or conquerors, right? So in that passage. And then he has this other one dealing with the seven times. So this must be the quote that he's referring to. He's going to talk about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the seven years, right? And the seven times, 360 years makes 25, 20 years. And then he says, um, for one half of seven times, that is three times and a half is called Revelation 12, verse 6, 1260 days. He also Revelation 12, 14, 13, verse 5. 42 months is the one half of 2520, or twice 1260 is 2520. Therefore, the solid substance of the whole is that the people of God would be among the beasts or kings of the earth seven times, which is 2520 years, one half of which time they would be among, they would be among the under literal Babylon, which means the ruling kings of the earth uh, vis-a-vis 1260 years, and the other half under mystical Babylon. The mother of harlots, the abomination of the whole earth, 1260 years, making it in all 2520 years. Therefore, seven times would be, uh, therefore, seven times would the people of God be punished for their sins, would fill up the measure of the sufferings of Christ before they would be delivered from all their enemies and come into possession of the glorified kingdom, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the earth. And Ezekiel alludes to the same seven times. Then he quotes Ezekiel 9, uh, 39, verse 9 and 10. They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, where he references it, and then he doesn't quote the whole thing. I'm not sure why. Jeremiah 15, verse 1 and 3, and shall set on fire, well, I guess he's referencing that. And she'll sit on fire and burn the weapons. And then there lies 15, 14. Both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the hand stays and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, nor cut down any out of the forests, for they shall burn the weapons with fire. They shall spoil those that spoil them and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel here gives us to understand that by means of the people of God being driven out of their cities and by the word of God, they would be enabled to destroy or be destroying their enemies and to spoil those who had been spoiling them and rob those who had robbed them. And this too would take seven years or 25, 20 days. And Ezekiel being commanded to reckon each day for a year, then it would be 25, 20 years. So I don't see his objection to any of this making any sense. It, it seems to me that he's just he, he's you know he's just trying to show the weakness of of Miller's understanding of the twenty five twenty, but he's not really addressing the twenty five twenty, especially not the way we understand it today. Of course, in two thousand and nine, we didn't have the understanding we have now. But but even then, it's just it's like poking holes, but, you know, without without really explaining anything. Um, it's like it's, it's more uh, polemical than anything. All right. In this in this situation, as as I listened to the reading and had read Ezekiel thirty nine nine, I'm having to wonder, you know, how we would relate those symbols 
not as a literal situation, but as a very much symbolic situation. Well, well definitely it's a symbol. I mean, Ezekiel, it, you know, Ezekiel, as far as I'm concerned, is apocalyptic literature. It's in the same class as Daniel and Revelation. Right. You know, it has narrative in it, as does uh, the book of Daniel. But a lot of these sections, the way the prophecies are written, are more in the line with what, what we class as apocalyptic in, rather than just straight prophecy. So so it has lots of different symbols um, that also are employed in the book of Revelation, such as Gog and Magog and things like that. But um, Though I, you know, I think to some degree the, the term apocalyptic is sort of, a, you know, it's it's a category made by man, right? It's not Bible doesn't talk about apocalyptic literature, but but it, it's definitely more in line with what we see in Daniel. So we have all these symbols, you know, obviously the weapons representing uh, war and so forth, and, and these are all going to be. It, you know, their enemies are basically going to destroy the weapons and so forth, and they're going to burn them with fire seven years. Now, I'm not really sure that I understand the prophecy itself. I would have to spend more time on it. But uh, definitely I wouldn't. I, I don't know how we could say that this is something that's already been fulfilled decades before Ezekiel makes the prediction. Like, so it would be nice if he explains what he meant. Well, it's like I, I went on to another portion of his website, and he had a document that he was copying, and he'd placed several footnotes within the document. Okay. Now, the numbering for the footnotes were there, but none of the footnotes were on the on the website. And so I had to shake my head, you know, why why go through the time of putting in the numbers if you're not going to provide your, your footnoted references? So this, yeah, is, well, this is one. Yeah, and where, also he, go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, just um, – so I was just looking at um, the Jameson Fawcett Brown's commentary on Ezekiel 39. Okay. Now, they're actually applying this to – uh, the desolation by Antiochus, right? So, um, and they they tend to take that sort of position. So they're applying it to Antiochus Epiphanes, um, right? So there's a period of six years and four months, which is 2,300 days, uh, when the temple worship was restored, and God, and I don't know how to pronounce this word, Mushaft. Okay. Uh, many trips to his people from this time to the death of Antiochus. Early in 149, a period of seven months, the Jews had rest from Antiochus and purified their land. And on the 25th day of the ninth month, celebrated Ania or Feast of Dedication. So, so he's talking about these 2,300 days. They never show up in Revelation because they're part of the 2520, which which I think is actually completely valid. So, uh, so the the interesting point here is that, um, that 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 I take away from this is that seven months, if taken from uh, 25, 20 years, uh, gives an approximately because uh, seven months is 210. So obviously, you know, seven months. We already understand this, like 220. Uh, subtract from 2520 gives you 2300. But I wonder if there's some connection here between these seven months that are mentioned in Ezekiel 39 and the seven years as as referencing the 2300 days. But anyway, it, it, it'd just be nice if he really explains what his objection is there. All, all it seems to me is it's uh, what they call muddying the waters. That's a, right. a logical fallacy. So, so people do this all the time. If they can't really have good arguments, they just do a lot of muddy in the waters. They make things so unclear. Uh, they throw in all kinds of objections like, uh, you know, something like uh, if somebody was arguing against the state of the dead, they say, oh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. 
for the 2520, it's it's taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, and Jehovah's Witnesses are obviously wrong. So, um, you know, so the 2520 is obviously wrong. You know, those types of of, of arguments that are made. So anyway, it's uh, just kind of kind of disappointing, I guess. It's, I would like to know more of what what Eugene Curry is thinking here, how he sees this. Well. Well, let's continue and see if there's anything further that, that he chooses to reveal. As he writes, when Adventism was splintering, the Sabbath-keeping portion held to more of Miller's original teaching than any other branch. They held to Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 9 as taught by Miller. They adopted his understanding, though slightly refined, of the latter portion of Daniel 12, and more or less to his understanding of large portions of Daniel 11. But we did not follow Miller on Leviticus 26. That's why you never grew up hearing about the 25, 20-year time prophecy. Now, it's interesting for me because that statement is antithetical to how I understood things because... When I was a, a teenager in the Adventist school system, that's one of the things that one of my Bible teachers taught was from the charts and the 2520 prophecy. Yeah, also the reason why we don't hear the 2520 prophecy in general, because I never heard of it, but I wasn't raised in Adventist. But even what he's saying here, we didn't follow Miller on Leviticus 26. Well, we should have. Yes. Right. We also should have looked at what Hiram Edson had to say. So, I mean, the fact that the church never, and, and the thing is, it wasn't, and, and I've tried to make this point when when people have objected to Leviticus 26, I say, okay, we have this, basically we have Uriah Smith is the only one who speaks against it. You do have Loughborough offering a different interpretation uh, in the early 1900s, uh, which makes no sense. His is that, you know, these uh, seven times have to do with seven different punishments or something or chastisements, which is not what it's it's saying. And so he, he put, says that there's like altogether 28 different chastisements and doesn't really explain it too much, but doesn't go into detail. But anyway, so... When we, we look at how the church addressed Leviticus 26 after the Great Disappointment, you can find them repeating it in publications, right? James White does as late as, like, it's not long before, let me see, what year was that uh, book on Miller that he did? I can't remember the year. But anyway, while he was still alive, <laughs> he, he still continued to support Miller's understanding of the prophetic periods, including the seven times of Leviticus 26. But what we never have is a systematic or official rejection of Leviticus 26, the seven times. So, you know, we don't have uh, the church going through and explaining it or officially uh, renouncing it, right? They, they try to take the James White's article that they attribute to James White, that is Uriah Smith's. But there's no discussion. And in 1863, they say, well, the 2520 was rejected. Now, maybe tacitly, but definitely not, not in any way that there's a publication or an article or a vote or anything regarding the 2520. So my, my, my view is that the 2520 is hidden. That is, it's, I mean, it suffers more from neglect than anything. So it's something that we neglect and weeds grow over it and we forget about it. You know, and there's a few people who still sort of remember it and, you know, it's still on the charts. It's still in the spirit of prophecy. So in a hidden fashion, you have to, you have to sort of know about it to recognize it. But it's so much so that when people read Great Controversy, page 351, they just see, oh, the last and longest time period brought to view in the Bible, that's, uh, that's the 2300 days. Not recognizing that the way Alan White is describing it 
is she's describing the 2520. The judgment is at hand is the 2300 days. And the everlasting kingdom will be ushered in is the 1335, right? And then she's going to go on to say that the preaching of the disciples, the 70 weeks, and the preaching of the Millerites, the 2300 days, are both a different portion of this same great uh, prophetic period, what Apollos Hale calls the grand period. And, and shows that, the, that, you know, that these other periods are portions of this grand period. So it's just, it's, it's not, it's, it's not officially rejected, but it is neglected and maybe, and, and not even officially neglected, right? Just, just forgot about. Right. So his reason, that is why you never grew up hearing about the 25, 20 year prophecy. I mean, you could say, well, we didn't follow Miller on Leviticus 26. You could say, well, that's kind of true. We didn't. But the why is much broader than merely we just didn't follow him. It's that we never rejected it in, in any meaningful way. There wasn't an analysis. We do have Hiram Edson, as he's going to mention next, uh, trying to reinterpret it. But that should but nobody even addresses that. So Hiram Edson publishes these articles. We have no response to them recorded anywhere by anybody. It's just just a non-issue. Okay. And, and the other thing we should remember is in the eight, after the disappointment, they continue to study, and they still put the 2520 on the 1850 chart. Correct. Right. And, and that was after all of that study that they had done. And, and, we, and we know that Jay and Andrew still accepted the 20 foot 20. And of course, James liked it. And I believe I liked it too. I think it's pretty clear. But anyway. So his next portion, Hiram Edson did make a stab at reinterpreting the 2520 in a way that could fit with Adventism. For it was clear that Christ did not in 1844 bring an end to Jewish captivity. Miller's expectation. I don't recall. That's not true. Yeah, I don't recall. He never, that. Yeah, he never says it brings an end to Jewish captivity. He, he talks about the people of God, but he right. understands that, that that's in relation to the fact that the people of God are not literal Israel in our day, right? So he doesn't apply it to the Jews. Miller, like all Seventh day Adventists, believe that God's people are not the Jews after their probation has closed. So there isn't a 25, 20 year period where literal Israel found in Leviticus 26. Or, yeah, so there is not a 25, 20 year, literal, 25, 20 year period for literal Israel, right? Miller never taught that. And that's often the objection that's brought is, well, literal Israel, you know, they, they don't have any part. You know, why would we have a 25, 20 year prophecy for literal Israel? Now, of course, evangelicals will use a 25, 20 year prophecy for literal Israel, usually ending in, you know, 1848. Some of them have another one ending in uh, or 1948, pardon me, and 1967. So they, they tie to some events, but it doesn't really make any sense. And they have to do really strange uh, gymnastics with their calculations. Right. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with those. I can't remember all their calculations offhand, but so anyway, it, yeah, it's, it, it would have been nice if the Seventh-day Adventist church had actually, you know, officially rejected the 2520 in some way. We still have not officially rejected it. I mean, we have some scholars who don't agree with it, but we have scholars who don't agree with all kinds of things that Adventists believe. So I, I, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it, it's kind of disappointing that the way that people argue against it, the way that they don't really, they, they create all these straw man arguments. They muddy the water. They do ad hominem attacks, sometimes quite uh, obliquely, but still yeah, much the same. Okay. Edson's article was printed at the request of James White before it had been matured. It was long, nearly 30,000 words. That's 47 single space sheets of typing paper. 
Edson differed from Miller significantly in that he dated the 2520 from 723 BC rather than from 677. The earlier date of Edson was based on the captivity of the 10 tribes extended to 1798. In Edson's view then, the first 1260 years were furnished inclusive at the commencement of the second 1260 year period. Thus it was the Christian church, not the Jews that were released in 1798. Okay, more mistakes here. Right. So it's going to be from the captivity of Hoshea, and he's not going to do inclusive. I'm not sure. He finished inclusive at the, yeah, so he's, yeah, it's not an inclusive count. I think I'm reading it here that the first 1260 years is an inclusive count. Right. Right, which it's not. Um And of course, it's not thus it was the Christian church, not the Jews that were released in 1798. That's not quite correct either. And also because one is Miller never taught it was the Jews that were released at the end of the 2520. And in and, and anything that I've seen, it's always the people of God. You know, one of the things about this too, we say, well, the, 20, the 2520 didn't find a fulfillment. That's why it was rejected. Nothing happened on October 22nd, 1844, that could be attributed to the ending of the 2520, right? That's sort of the argument. Right. Uh, um, but if we understand what the 2520 was, that it was connected to the Jubilee and that the Jubilee is connected to the 10th day of the seventh month, um, it actually fulfills the type perfectly uh, with the beginning of the Day of Atonement. You know, Christ didn't come back either in connection with the 2300 days. So, you know, I'm not quite sure. You know, it'd be, it would be making an argument against the 2300 days as well. Like nothing happened on October 22nd, 1844. So if you're arguing against the 2520 on that regard, you're arguing against the 2300 days on that regard. Right. Okay. Edson's article, in all fairness to him, was nothing like a statement of what the pioneers believed, either before its publication or at its publication. It was the result of his personal investigation, and he presented it with a request for his brethren to evaluate whether or not it would be useful. As I have not time at present to mature the subject, I send you a portion of the broken, unmatured ideas as they are. I do not ask that they now go out as adopted or sanctioned by the review, but merely for the examination and inspection of the brethren. And if the subject by them be judged to be of service to the church and worthy of further investigation, then it may be hereafter be revised, improved and carried out in its further bearing and extent. Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, 3rd of January, 1856. Here he states much of Edson's article was a response to the first day Adventist attempt to find in prophecy an allusion to an age to come of peace and prosperity on the earth, especially for the Jews. Now, the footnote that he places here is a bit lengthy. It states the article takes a number of unfamiliar positions. Among them, Revelation 17 was fulfilled between 1798 and 1844 the eighth head being the short-lived dynasty of Napoleon. This dynasty is the scarlet-colored beast. The ten horns are the powers surrendered to Napoleon. He teaches that the mountain of the Lord's house in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 is the United States. He teaches that the two questions in Daniel 8.13 have different answers, one in reference to the 2300 days, and the other to the 2520, or to the second 1260. He teaches that the hidden mistake in the 44 chart was the timing of the 2520. He gives a spiritualized interpretation to Ezekiel chapters 37 to 39 that is fascinating. The coming of the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, he finds not in the 1844 judgment scene, but in the 1798 judgments 
on the Roman Catholic Church. He teaches that the time prophecies in Revelation were also sealed like those of Daniel until 1798. Some of these positions have merit enough to warrant investigation. It does not appear that even one of them was adopted by any of the other pioneers, nor were any of them ever mentioned in writing a second time by Edson. So the premise here of Pruitt is that Edson was introducing multiple ideas different from what Miller had introduced. The, yeah, and he's going to bring, he's going to present all of these, through it is. Uh, like, he's not showing any of the arguments, or obviously not, but, um, and how this can be reconciled. Now, I'm not sure I quite agree with some of his interpretations of Iremetson's articles as well, because I have read through them. I, de- I don't pick up some of these things that he's saying. So, and, and I don't quite trust Pruitt's interpretation of things. What it's meant to do is just to have us dismiss this. And even though you said some positions have merit enough to warrant investigation, right? We're not going to do that because none of these were adopted by any of the pioneers. So why would we waste our time? Okay. Right. Right. And even Edson sort of abandoned them. It is, is sort of the, the idea. So the thing that Pruitt's good at doing is he's good at appearing as being objective and open-minded when he's really not. Agreed. Yeah. And I never really like that approach, and you, you can understand why. I mean, a person should be, your yes should be yes and your no, no. We should be as open as the day. We shouldn't be... Uh, crafty in our arguments. It doesn't mean that we're not as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I mean, um, I mean, we can be sometimes too direct or too bold that, you know, it creates prejudice. But here he's not, he's not really giving this a fair evaluation. He is, he is setting up as many possible roadblocks in the mind of the reader from even considering that the 2520 might be something that we should look at. He's making it look like he's looked at it and he's found all of these problems. And so even though he's not telling us don't look at it, he's telling us don't look at it. Right. He wants to be set up as the authority for people to trust. Yeah, you know, and this is a problem, you know, that, um, you know, that I'm, that I'm having to some degree with how people respond to me in studies that I'm doing here or whatever, is that people have this tendency to look to somebody for answers. Right. If you present something, I mean, I I present things to people because I want them to examine them, right? I want them to think about it, to study it on their own. And I always try to tell people that's what I want. But people are generally inclined just to accept somebody's word or not, right? So it's more about the person. Should I accept what this person is saying based upon the person themselves, not based upon what they have said? I don't know if you you agree that that's kind of how what we see in Adventism. We follow people. It's the way many too. And and I'm not particularly certain why. I mean, obviously, if somebody's, you know, a good speaker and they present some ideas and they're logical, you, you might read more of their papers and, and studies. But you don't just accept everything they say just because you like them. You're going to examine. You know that, that we all are faulty in our understanding, that, that we don't understand everything correctly. There's lots of things that, you know, that I understand correctly. There's lots of things that I need to be corrected on. So if somebody was to follow me, that would be silly, right? You know, if they're just going to accept what I'm saying about anything, unless, you know, they can look at the arguments and evaluate them for themselves. 
So, you know, I, but it's hard. It's, it's a problem that I've always seen. And, and one of the reasons I don't particularly like being a speaker, right, and definitely not a leader, because I never want anybody following me. Right? I don't want people just, you know, saying, and, and I have this, you know, in my early Adventist experience in the upper room studies, you know, people would say, well, you know, we just ask theater and we can get the answer. Well, I, I definitely didn't know much. I was a new Adventist, but I seemed to know a lot because I'm well read. But even then, I was wrong in many things that I said back then because I didn't understand enough. But people were, were happy to just, you know, it's like, you know, people will ask their priest or ask their pastor or see what Doug Batchelor says or look at a commentary or whatever. And even sometimes just finding a statement in the spirit of prophecy to agree with some view or opinion or idea, at least seemingly, rather than studying things out completely, taking the time to patiently go through the scriptures prayerfully and carefully to evaluate everything and see whether you're wrong or not and, and to be corrected. And that is what we are to do. And that's, that's what I, I try to do all the time, even in the comments that people send and put on, on the YouTube videos. I mean, one of the reasons I like that people do that, even when they have some rather odd ideas, is I, I want people to see the type of dialogue that goes on when there's opposition to an idea. Right. That, that it's, you know, you don't just, you know, dismiss the person. Um, you, you take time with them. Now, sometimes, you know, some of the stuff's pretty out there and people claiming to be basically prophets. There's this one guy who believes he's Enoch or something. And, uh, you know, he put a bunch of uh, statements on there. And, uh, I inadvertently removed his statements. I didn't mean to do that because uh, I wanted them to stay there. But right. uh, um, so uh, I was just trying to get to block him from just dumping tons and tons of statements on my videos, which maybe I shouldn't have done that. But you know, it was like you know, we, but I still tried to address his arguments. I tried to interact with him and he wouldn't interact. He's just dumping statements after statements of like long things that are prepared. I don't really like when people copy and paste their stuff. I want to interact with the person, right? If I write something, I want that person to write back to me, not just post stuff from their website. You know, as long as they can, right? As many as they will allow them to make in the, the comment, you know. So, but anyway, the point is we try to be fair. And if you're going to present somebody's view, like we did with Collins. Um, so Colin had, you know, presented some ideas. I tried to evaluate his ideas and present them as fairly as I could. I definitely didn't do it in a polemical style. I didn't misrepresent him. I didn't, uh, you know, tear down his character or anything. Because one is, I don't have anything bad to say about Colin. Other than that, you know, they, they don't want to engage at the present time, which I think is bad. But, you know, I believe there was light in what was what was presented. And so you need to examine what people say for light. And that's not what was done here by Pruitt. He's not trying to look at, is there maybe some light that we could gather from this, right? He's just, and that's one of the real problems I have is that we have Leviticus 26 and people will say, well, we got it wrong. Well, where is the correct interpretation of Leviticus 26? How is it fulfilled? That, that's basically the approach I use said, well, if Leviticus 26 isn't about 25, 20 years, how was it fulfilled? And as I worked on its fulfillment, I realized it, it was connected to the 2300 days because it's the captivity of Judah in Babylon. And, you know, with this 220 years, with these 70-year periods and the decrees that start to 2300 days, so it, it's connected to the 2300 days. 
But if anybody was to take the time to do that, they would find the same thing, that it's, it's a valid prophetic period. It's just that we can't jump to it as quickly as Miller did. We would have to do, you know, more, more study to understand it. Theodore, what you're describing, one of the things you're describing is who we trust as an authority. Yeah, I can't go to school for eight years or 10 years, or 12 years, get PhDs and so on to verify everything as fact for myself. We do have trusted sources of authority in our own life. Who do we trust uh, as an authority on any issue? And so that is one thing that is that happens with us. It's it's a valid thing. We we do need trusted sources of authority, and of course, for us ultimately, for truth, it's the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And some things can take a long time to figure out. So shortcuts are sources of authority that are trusted by us personally. We each have our own go-tos. So that is one challenge. Ultimately, personally, speaking just for myself, there's a thing that I experienced early on as a Christian, and it was the ring of truth. So things that I have proven true, when I come upon something new, if it doesn't, isn't in harmony, doesn't ring true with in harmony with what I've learned so far, it's pretty easy to pass by it. But there are things that, like you say, there's Satan mixes truth with error. And things can ring true, but there's they're just off a little bit. They're not, not quite fitting in with the harmony of everything. And that, that, to me, is my red flags. And not that I reject, but I reserve. And it's okay to reserve opinion, and it should be in a discussion. shouldn't be getting what they call dismissive or saying, I like the way she put it, positive assertions, to, to dismiss with positive statements. I'm not quite sure what she means there, but that's one of our challenges. Sources of authority and who do we trust as an authority? And, and it might be Doug Batchelor for some or whoever, a personality. And that can be a starting point for us, but uh, th- that is one of the challenges. Who do we trust as a source yeah. of authority? Yeah, I, I, I understand that. So um, now you bring up some good points. So one is there's the ring of truth. Well, one is um, there are things that we know to be true individually that we've come to trust from God's word, right, in in our Christian experience. And we know that any new light, any new information, we we all fit it into this puzzle, right? So we have these puzzle pieces of this picture that we are building of our understanding of God and and our relationship with God. And things can be uh, presented that we can see, well, this is a useful piece. This fits with what I already know and understand, right? So that's, that's you would agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Although that so, can be, car- that, that's also a, a caution because what's that argument? Looking for things that we confirmation already bias. agree with. Yeah, confirmation, confirmation. bias. That's, right. And, and that yeah. is one thing to be aware of. Right. I'll so one this. of the things we do. Yeah. Okay, William. I read this quote this morning. Can I read it? Yeah. This is um, manuscripts. It's from manuscripts. I think uh, uh, volume one in the book is manuscripts. Uh, Manuscript manus- Yeah, manuscripts. Re- manuscripts released 64, 1903. And it's the first paragraph. It says, Moses was chosen by God as a messenger of his covenant. The Lord called him up into the mountain to receive the words of God to Israel. Today, God's chosen man as he has chosen Moses to be his messengers. 
They are not to be mediators. They are to point to Christ as the all submit all winner of the mediator. They must, yeah, mediator. They must first receive instructions from the living oracles of God. Then they are to impart the knowledge they have received, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Every word they speak must be spoken in truth. God will require the lives of those who turn the truth of God into a lie and teach falsehood. Their example will lead others to falsehood. But those who thus <clears throat> prevent God's truth will never become members of the royal family. It is dangerous now to be un- unable to discern the truth. Those who would, would administer the word of God must be men who know the, his will. They must be careful careful they must be careful least they misunderstand the word of the Lord with the word of God and make mistakes which will which will need to be recirculated or something I think that's right re classified or something like that. But that's the quote I was I read this morning and then brought me to which I've been saying about about who we should listen to and who we should. It's kind of okay. Interesting. So go ahead. Okay. Who's going to speak? Go ahead, Theodore. Yeah. So um, I'll jump in. I actually, uh, I'll say. Okay. I'd like to segue off what William was saying. There, he's bringing up something that's that's going on. The idea of making a list of people that are checked off is good to listen to and I don't know if the list also includes people not to listen to but the idea is it has to have the imprimatur of whoever is making that list so that's kind of what's going on right now it's actually causing some problems it, and 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 the quote uh, the quote being used right now uh, in the Canadian group, or perhaps it's the American group, is is uh, the quote uh, submitting to the brethren of experience, and that quote is being used to, I guess, uh, to to make a list of who are the brethren of experience to submit to that we should just listen. I think they mis I think they I think they misapplying it and using it to Well um, yeah. Well yeah. I, I was gonna bring up that's the exact quote that the elders used to disfellowship me because I wouldn't submit to their authority. Now I was willing to uh, submit to their authority as a Sabbath school teacher, as a deacon as a member of the church, they have authority in what I'm going to teach in Sabbath school or what I'm going to share as as a from a position in the church. They have authority over my position in the church, but they they pushed it even further to wanting authority in my life. What I could say, what I could think about. <laughs> practically uh, I just certainly wasn't at liberty to share my thoughts on anything that they didn't approve of the 2520 in particular so to shut down discussion because a dangerous idea might be about that's not how we're to handle it in early writings she she mentions you know that don't dismiss their evidence but give it its just weight look at it fairly, and then bring the light of truth. And that might convince them that, hey, you know, I made a mistake, and they will be corrected by 
the light of truth, not by our objections in answer to them and their ideas, but in a spirit of love for them, that can, because, boy, I get agitated too, you know, I want to, no, you're wrong, look, here, but to hold back on that and just meekly present what I think is truth in contrast, and, and then they have a turn in doing the same, and that is beneficial discussion, that when we take a personal kind of, it's my idea, I I believe this, so it's got to be true. And if it's not, then or if you're if it's true, you're not, and you shouldn't really be talking about it. So that I, that's, it's like a suppression of yeah. truth. Well, it's, it, it, well, it, and and it's also um, I mean dangerous in lots of ways. So, for instance, they said that you wouldn't submit. Now, what they were trying to do is is assert their authority in an area that, is, that that they don't have authority, right? They don't have authority in what you do in your private life. So part of the problem that they've said makes me, because you're associated with the 2520, even if you never presented in Sabbath school, which I never have, and even though you never presented from the pulpit, which I never have, we can't endorse you as a person because you're attached to an idea, right? You, you understand? Yes, I do. I follow. Yeah, and that's what they do. So that's what they do. Yeah, and 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 that's completely unfair, right? Especially since there's lots of people who are attached to all kinds of really bad ideas, errors that that are actively involved in the church, right? So it, it's it's not really fair. It doesn't give a person an opportunity. In a sense, you have to recant of ever believing that thing. You can't. You can't even study something, right? So you can't examine something outside of what they want you to examine. Because I mean, initially, I mean, you're just looking at something. At least for me personally, it was just let's discuss this, right? As far as you know, in my personal life, I never brought it into the church. I don't know why. You know, you you can't study independently anyway. But the, the other point, just to which I think is more important here right now, is, is this idea of authority that you bring up. So the authority, when, when we listen to a good speaker, the reason why we listen to them is because the way that they present things is from God's word and from the spirit of prophecy. And we can then, done in a way that we can examine it, um, we're not being manipulated. We shouldn't be just taking their word for it somebody presents something in a way you just need to take my word for it even if they don't actually say that but they act in that way then that would be something that we you know we, we can't really study with them. we can't really follow them because we have no they have no backing so we have to we have to be able to study ourselves we can we don't have to be theologians like, I definitely don't think everybody has to do all the work that I did on chronology to actually confirm that it's true, right? You don't, you don't have to be an expert on an ancient calendars and so forth to see that what is being presented agrees with established truths and that there are, confirm, there are things that you can confirm. Um, that's one of the things I like about Stephen's charts where he connects all of these different uh, um, spans of times and dates and so forth, you can see that the chronology must be correct because it has multiple witnesses as to its correctness, right? And these things can be checked out without becoming an expert because if we all have to become theologians to know what to believe, and that's kind of our Minders and, you know, you with their group. I mean, we're following the same example as the papacy. If we are are setting up people that we we have to listen to now, as far as the men of experience, Jeff before was clear that Ellen White was referring to the pioneers in the past, right? That you know the men of experience are those who have gone through the first and second angels and third angels messages, right? Is, 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 
Am I correct in right. how Jeff applied it? Yes, yes, it is. So, and that, and, so and that is the correct interpretation today. of that. Yeah, it can't be any person alive today, right? Now, if we were going to try to apply it to today, uh, I'm not sure. You know, it'd be sort of arbitrary. I mean, who is who is who are the men of experience? People who've been a long time in the movement. But I, I didn't ever submit my authority, submit to the authority of a person who wasn't clearly following, you know, the Bible, right? So uh, I, I need to evaluate the authority is the Bible. And submitting to men of experience in the one hand uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, there is a certain level of authority that a person can have, but it never supersedes the authority of God's word or the authority of our personal relationship with God. No man can come between us and God. Bringing it back to Pruitt, what, what you described or what has been described uh, in him presenting the other side in a uh, less than fair light is what we call poisoning the well before someone gets there. And uh, that, that I saw played out. So it was played out before my eyes and I didn't realize what was going on at the time. I was just a, a naive person thinking that uh, I'm going to get a chance to explain my position or ideas or thoughts. But before I got there, the well was poisoned quite thoroughly, and I even sat there in the foyer waiting for the elders to begin the meeting. While I was waiting, the associate pastor would come out, check on me. Oh, good, yeah, keep waiting. We're we're almost ready for you. And then he would go into his office and photocopy some more materials, go back in and share those materials, explain to the all the elders why I'm wrong. And they're right. And I would be in the foyer, not even having a chance to know what's being said. And when I walked into the room, oh, the eyes of judgment were on me. And anything that I was going to say was going to be, of course, taken with a grain of salt that was too salty. <laughs> or I don't know. The, every analogy fails somewhere. But I didn't stand a chance. And that's kind of what Pruitt is doing here, is poisoning the well, giving an unfair or unthorough representation of what things are. And then uh, people are going to see in it what he's already planted in their mind, the seeds of suspicion and doubt and trust in authority. It's coming from someone in authority. Eugene Pruitt's well-known. He's kind of an authority in some churches or areas and groups that follow him as a trusted source of authority. So anyway, that's one of the observations I'm seeing. Well, I know the, the Charmans rejected the 2520 basically based on Vance Farrell's say so, because they were follower of Vance Farrell. So, and Vance Farrell completely misrepresents the 2520. Um, and the history I, I, I like, I like what happened. I liked what happened with that in the Warburg Church when, when uh, Greg and yourself, I think it was, you, you were presenting on the 2520 or Will, Willie Miller or something, and he stood at the door and handed out materials on the 2520, why it wasn't true. And then we had lunch together. It was, yeah, well, I, actually, I, I, what I presented, if I remember correctly, was... Mm -hmm. um, the disappointment of the Millerites and the dis disappointment of the disciples and the parallel. And um, I addressed that disappointment, you know, showing the 1843 and 1850 charts uh, just on a PowerPoint, not actual in person. But, uh, okay. um, but, but, the, and I, I did mention, you know, the, the 2520 was on the chart. Right, that there was these different prophetic periods. I think basically yeah. a brief description of the 1843 chart. Um, yeah, so they handed out Vance Farrell's uh, articles against the 2520. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but you know, see there, yeah, the, the, and, and yeah, it was fair. It was fair, you know. Present this, yeah, present that, fair, present this, present way, that, not shut you that, down. 
yeah, but yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, would have been even so more fair if after. I was standing just. Pe- it would have been even more fair if I was standing just after Greg handing you know, out twenty five twenty positives. <laughs> But I didn't want to get into that. But yeah, I I, I like that it. I don't know. It seems like uh, they're not afraid to discuss things. No, but the thing is, you know, they would never. They would no. They didn't want to discuss it after they handed out that article. There was no discussion. Vance Farrell had okay proved that you know it was uh, that uh, Livermore lady but, who had brought. But he was the trusted 20. authority. Yeah, it proved that Vance Farrell was a trusted uh, a trusted authority on the matter. Yeah, even though most of what he presented was was false. Mm-hmm. So, you know, things like you know the twenty five twenty. Originally, it said it wasn't on the eighteen fifty chart, but then later it says, well, it's on the chart, but you need a magnifying glass to read it. Hmm. You know, things like that. And Her- Harriet Livermore was the one who actually brought the 2520 to the Millerite movement. It was added um, in 18, uh, in the 1840s. It was added to um, the Millerite understanding that Miller never actually taught it. So all kinds of errors in uh, Vance Farrell's. And I'm a fan of Vance Farrell. I mean, I liked his stuff. But there, it was, you know, definitely uh, polemical. But... Um, so, you know, we're, we're bringing up some good points. So one of the things, you know, that's, that's another problem dealing with authority and dealing with prejudice. Uh, so, you know, on Sabbath, I presented to you a dozen people um, the story of Joseph and putting that all on the line and, and showing that the, the 2520 connected to, so Joseph and Christ connected together and how you can show the 2520 without using Leviticus 26. Now, one of the things that, you know, I have to do is there's quite a few people there I've never met before. I don't know what they think. And you you try your best to, um, you know that there might be prejudice out there. So there's nothing wrong with sort of answering objections before they come up, which is what I always try to do. So you you try to anticipate what people might say um, or what they might think or things that they've been told. And so to sort of disarm people, that's, you know, it's it's part of what you have to do to present. Because the waters have been muddy, right? Because the well has been poisoned, that you you have to present things in 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 a way that's going to answer some of to some of those objections that already may exist in their minds. And of course, the other thing that I always want to do when I present, you know, is present the gospel. You know, that Christ's Cross is the center of all of these things. So you show, you know, Jesus 2520. So these are all things that are important. But there is this problem within within Adventism that people are just looking for someone to to listen to, but they don't feel qualified to actually study it on their own and evaluate. But as we've kind of been taught that we need an authority to listen to and that we can't evaluate things for ourselves. It, it sort of seems to be part of the, it, it never used to be part of our culture within Adventism, but it seems to have changed just, over the time that I've been Adventist. Yes, I was just going to say amen and amen because that has changed since I've become an Adventist. Uh, it used, used to be, okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's discuss it, but study it look at it for yourself it's it wasn't a dangerous thing and it was encouraged it was expected in adventism but now you're right it's come down to we're over we're over busy we're busy about many things and we we are looking for the quick and easy answers because so many things in our life are pressing upon us to to do to take time away from listening to everything that gives us shortcuts in what's right and what's true. That's, we that need to know God's voice. become a problem. We need to know how to listen to God. We need to know his voice. We need to have that personal relationship with God in our understanding of his word. 
Instead, we put man in the place of God. We have a relationship with the church. We have a relationship with preachers, with pastors, with teachers. But we don't have a personal relationship with God to know what is truth. And, and it used to be, I remember a pastor, when the first pastor I had in Warburg when I moved there. I mean, he did a sermon on how on the priesthood of all believers and that, you know, he's just an administrator, um, that you have to know the truth for yourself. And, and then later we had a pastor who, who um, objected to the idea that he needs to look at every stray wind of doctrine that comes along. And I said, well, if you have church members who are believing something, it's your responsibility as a pastor to know what they believe and to study it out with them. Not obviously, you don't have to look at every stray wind of doctrine that doesn't affect your local church necessarily. But you need to know what people believe, and you need to follow what the Council of White Cave. But what he believed is just that the church was the authority, and if our church doesn't teach it, we can't study it. So quite a, quite a change. No, that yeah, that is very people. Kind of an interesting discussion that we've had so far. Now, I look at what Pruitt had had to say here, that he chooses now to refer to the expectations of the age to come from the appendix of Daniel and Revelation. Now, while the appendix was part of Pruitt's, or excuse me, Smith's books, I don't recall seeing them referenced in any manner within his articles um so the age to come is in daniel and revelation uh so under where he addresses the 2520 and says it was the age to come that's your eye smith correct um hiram edson doesn't adjust, address that right because they didn't exist right right so get something later um so he makes this mistake because I'm pretty sure the age to come were not before 1856 when Hiram Edson wrote his article. Right. I mean, the way the way that I've looked at this since I was I was challenged Friday evening to look at Smith's initial publication of his understanding of Revelation and then look at this with Daniel. And it is true that Smith wrote his studies out of the book of Revelation prior to doing the book of Daniel. So he was doing things pretty much directly opposite to what Father Miller had done. Yeah. Where Okay. Now, I'm a bit corrected here. It was uh, the age to come uh, comes from the Advent Harbinger, published in Rochester, New York. Okay. Uh, it was the first sounding board for the age to come movement, and that was 1850 and 1851. Okay. okay so, so it was there, though my understanding of it is that there's uh, what, what um, Uriah Smith is addressing is something that's later. Right. But I'm, I'm just reading an article. I got to see if. I mean, so there's obviously something early connected to the age to come, but the age to come, my understanding is a term that's later, but I'm, I'm going to have to do some research on it. Okay. Well, the portion that, that Pruitt includes in his book that Smith had within Daniel and Revelation begins as this. Almost every scheme of the plan of the ages, age to come, etc., makes use of the supposed prophetic period called the seven times. And the attempt is made to figure out a remarkable fulfillment by events in Jewish and Gentile history. All such speculators might as well spare their pains, for there is no such prophetic period in the Bible. Here is Smith saying to us that the seven times of Leviticus 26 is a scheme, and he is very much denigrating how this is to be approached. I mean, this, this should give us the first sign that it's Uriah Smith, because he uses this polemical type of language all the time. Exactly. Uh, which James White, James White does not. Exactly. Um, 
So uh, another thing, so we, when we come back to this tomorrow, I, I'll have a bit more information on it um, okay. because I'm reading this article here. And so I was correct as far as the age to come is, and, and when you look at Planet of the Ages, that's actually uh, connected with uh, Charles Taze Russell, right? So by the time he wrote Daniel and Revelation there, and he talked Russell about the Planet of the Watch Ages. Tower? Russell of the Watchtower? Yeah, that's, yeah. So he wrote a book called Plan of the Ages, which I, I used to have. And it was using things like uh, the Egyptian pyramid and the measurements of it and so forth. And so, so that's much later, um, the Plan of the Ages. The Age to Come um, is going to be connected with Barber. I can't remember his first name, George, or something like that. That is that uh, Charles Taze Russell is going to follow, and and Barber is going to have um, it's going to be 1876 or something like that or 1878 that that uh, um, Christ is supposed to return. When he doesn't, he comes invisibly to the earth, and then Charles Taze Russell picks up with that with the new date based on the 2520. That's going to have Christ returning in 1914. And when he doesn't, then he just came invisibly to the earth. So he borrowed Barber's an excuse for his disappointment. So, so the plan of the ages age to come is much later. But I guess those, the ideas began in the 1850s. So, so I'm just going to read more about that and figure that out. But I, I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with uh, the Church of God and the Christadelphians. I've heard yeah, of them. Yeah, I've no, actually I've gone to Church a Christadelphian evangelistic service. Yeah, the Church of God Seventh Day and the Church of God uh, First Day. So they're kind of offshoots of Adventism. Mm -hmm. You know, Millerite Adventism. But, you know, to say that higher medicine is actually arguing against the age to come, I don't think is the case. I'm, I'm, I really think that what he's he's doing is he's he's recognizing that there is this two 1260s because he understands the two desolating powers and so he's just recognizing this other 2520 as an alternative but you know if they had spent time and put it all together they could have had prophetic mirror they just didn't so, anyway go on dwight no problem okay well as we are now at the, at the time of the close of our study. We will be returning to this portion for tomorrow. Now, there's another document that I have I have copied that we will get into that is by Pruitt, which he entitled Daniel 8 and the Daily. So we're going to go through this portion and take a look at exactly why Pruitt is choosing to include this from the appendix of thoughts on Daniel and Revelation and analyze not only what is being said, but also consider the language. So does anyone have any other comments or questions at this time? Well, so so I do want to finish up this age to come thing tomorrow. So I'll right. do some research on that. You know, we can see that this article this is from this here is uh, from the appendix of Daniel and Revelation. Right. And we can see how the same arguments are being used here as being used in January 26, 1864 article that's falsely attributed to James White. The same type of language, the same types of arguments. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of the things we need, to, we need to look at, but I think the discussion that we had regarding authority and how to study and, and what's happening within the movement are definitely really important points that we need to address in our own lives. Agreed. Because, because, you know, the last thing I ever want is people to just accept what I say because, you know, I'm a nice guy or you like me or something or you think I'm smart or, or something like that. I want people to study because we need to have our own experience and we need to learn to listen to God's voice 
We need to have that personal relationship with God. And, you know, people always talk about it, but I, I don't think people know what they're saying because a personal relationship with God is obeying God. He that says that I know God and keeps not his commandments is a liar. Now, of course, we can all look at our lives and see that we have not kept God's commandments, but we need to recognize that. And, and we need to recognize that God is there as a loving God seeking to bring us along with him. He asks us to yoke up with him. That's the yoke of obedience. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He can, he can give us rest from our labors. And that's the whole primary reason that we're studying in the first place. We're not studying to tear down on other people. We're not studying to win an argument. We're not studying to make up to make us to other people think better of us because we, we are correct. We're not studying to tear down the church. We're not stu- we're studying to build up others because we want to be connected to Christ. Right. And we want to reflect his character and we want to have an influence for good. And that's why I dislike polemics. The type of, and I dislike, you know, character assassination, misrepresenting what people say, because none of that is constructive, and, and we need to we need to be able to to help other people uh, to know God, and and then not because you know we say so that they believe something. It, it, it's not going to help them. They need to have that experience themselves. They need to know what they believe. They need to know their God personally. And so that doesn't, you know, so we share things we have studied, but we share them from God's word. And the authority is always God's word. And if you put a man in the place of God, Alan White says, God removes the wisdom that he gave him. So Mm. if people were to put me in the place of God, God would remove the wisdom that he's given me. Right? So Uh, I don't want that to to happen. Further to your thought on studying for for ourselves. I know in the past, when you've presented quite a lot of complicated information on it, it's complicated in that it's got so many points in it to verify, it goes deeper and deeper, all connected, all all part of a structure, and then encouraging me to study. And I look at that and I go, where do I begin? But God showed me something recently about personal study through circumstances, my phone broke, and that was my main source of everything. It was my computer, and uh, they're quite a thing nowadays. And so here I sit, no phone to entertain me, distract me, keep me busy about many things, like commenting on a post on Facebook. Even. <laughs> Boy, that can get a guy down a rabbit hole. Well, here I sit, quiet. What am I going to do? Oh, I know. Here's a novel idea. I, I'm going to look in my books. I have so many good books. And just randomly pick something, you know, Spirit of Prophecy. Something I think I haven't read before or have read before and open it. And I've opened it with new eyes to read a hard copy book, underline it, take my time, right down to even the word that she uses. And what does it really mean? You know, just thinking about it like that, that to me is studying for myself. It may not be particularly a topic that I'm encouraged to study in, but it leads to it. It connects to it. If it's if what I'm reading, well, what I what I'm reading is true. And if it kind of meshes with what I'm being, what I'm studying, what what we're discussing, it, it, it seems to have been providentially relating back so to use that word organically it's it's happening because it's truth and it relates and connects so as we study our personal studies whatever it is that god is drawing our attention to the question on our mind or whatever that we're searching out it's all a chain of truth in in, in my experience so by encouraging we, we us can to try study, to say- even that much, just reading something. Yeah, we, we can trust that God can teach us, right? God can teach us. We need to trust that. Amen. Anyway, we'll come Amen. back to this tomorrow. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Father in heaven, 
We thank you for this conversation that we've had today. We thank you for the points that have been cut, considered and all that you are doing to guide us in these studies. Be with us now. Give us wisdom and strength through this day. Help us to understand all that you would have us to do. For this, we thank you, and for this, we praise you. Help our minds to be centered upon you so that your character and your name may be prevalent before all that we come in contact with today. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.